everybody for coming. First of all, you know, what an amazing conference, huh? I mean, it's like, yeah, thank you. But it's been like, uh, I mean, for us, coming from, we coming from the Power Zone team and being able to be with you and get to talk to you, be able to learn about how you're using Power Zone, it's, it's an amazing experience. So thank you. And, you know, hopefully in the future, you know, you continue coming to these events because it's very helpful for us to interact with you, uh, learn, you take that feedback, that information back to the team so we can actually continue innovating uh, with PowerShell and DSD. And so, yeah, it's pretty amazing. My name, by the way, is, is Angel Calvo. I am the group program manager responsible for PowerShell Azure configuration as well as the automation systems uh, within the Azure. And we're going to go into a little bit of detail what that means is some of the changes that we made uh, recently in the organization and why all these things are coming together. Ken Hansen, been around PowerShell a while, still around PowerShell and playing with DevOps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And our PowerShell heroes, our new Isn't that awesome? you know, logo like that we hero. start. Uh, you know, very proud of it. I think it represents really a lot of the who we are as a, as a team. So anyway, the agenda. So we're going to kind of do a, a pretty quick recap about the last 12 months, all the different things that we that are in the organization that we have delivered together with you and the community. We're going to do some stats about the usage of PowerShell and how it's really becoming you know, a pretty core uh, language and tool for a lot of people, in the, especially in the Windows space. Uh, we're going to do a community update. I think one of the things that you're going to start seeing from our organization more and more is how you, the community, is helping make PowerShell a great product. And um, We're going to talk about the organization changes that we recently made. I think it's important for us to be transparent with you about why we're making the changes in the, in the organization and the investments and how all those changes will basically help us to take PowerShell into the future. Uh, we'll do some roadmap, some uh, direction, uh, where are we going? What are the things that they are coming up with in the next six to 12 months? We're not doing any demos of that, though. <laughs> we may have one. We may have one. <laughs> we might we have, have one. one. We, so, we might have one at the end, if you're all good. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we're going to do a very quick view of some of the features that's coming out with PowerShell 6, some of the changes in DSC and the new LCM. For all of you who went to uh, Kenneth's presentation yesterday about DevOps, we're going to kind of do a recap about how we start thinking about uh, uh, DevOps as a transforming chain, not only just in the industry, but in ours uh, as well. One as, hour into one slide. Yeah. Which, so that's our... <laughs> and then uh, we're going to talk about the future investments. This is about a combination of things that we are certain, other things that we think they are predictions. Right. And then... Maybe we'll show a, a pretty nice demo about something that is coming up in the next week. So, oh God, the last 12 months, months, huh? You know, every, it's kind of interesting. Jeffrey actually says this before, so I'll credit you appropriately. Um, when you're in the midst of all this stuff, it just gets frustrating because it feels like there's so much that needs to get done. And then you see all the stuff you're not doing. I don't know if you guys experience that, but we do. We're going, oh, we got to do this. Oh, I got to do that. Gotta... But it's kind of fun to sort of step back every 12 months and go, oh, we did do a lot of stuff, you know what I mean? And so if you just take a look at the transformational aspect over this past 12 months, it's been huge. It's yeah. actually been huge. We did start out, um, I mean, the whole PowerShell 6 open source was a massive effort, but even just the basics of finally getting a PowerShell Asia Summit, right? I mean, these conferences are actually vital to us. We spent a lot of time five or six years ago trying to figure out how we wanted to organize them, making sure they were not organized by Microsoft and actually reaching through other people and Community just done a fantastic job. So yeah. we're really proud of having that Asia Summit. And it'll have the next year, it'll be tied perhaps to an actual DevOps days. Um, and we'll sort of blend those together. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, our continuous cadence with Windows, I mean, that's something that I know sometimes people have questions. It's like, are we investing in Windows and Windows PowerShell? The answer is, yes, of course we are. Uh, in reality as well is that, you know, as you can see, you know, just by the last 12 months, you know, we just released a, a number of features across an entire portfolio from WMF, to Windows, Windows Server. And now we're default on Windows? Yeah, we are default and now. Thanks to now, you, by the way. You know, guys, PowerShell is the default help. shell. You guys <laughs> uh, editor services, I mean, I think this is a tremendous job that uh, David Wilson has been doing for the last year together with the community. I think this is a, for us sort of our future from a tooling perspective, how we're thinking about cross platform 
is how we're going to enable you know you and the rest of the community to do cross platform editing with PowerShell. Uh, the number of OSS projects has been it's been, awesome. it's been amazing. I mean, from Plaster, Paxter, PS Readline. I mean, the list continues growing over time, Pisaac, and we're going to continue supporting them. Well, Pisak is out there. We haven't taken it yet. Yeah, well, well it's almost there. Uh, PowerShell and DSC integration with Azure Automation and Control. How many of you guys have been into? How many of you guys have contributed at least an issue to the open source stuff? Awesome. Wow, that's pretty good. I saw it. That's a lot more hands than I thought. Pause, reflect on your life, <laughs> <laughs> and contribute, please. No, <laughs> even it's just just even small elements are helpful here. And we'll show that when we talk about yep. community contributors, but even just doing documentation, just raise an issue. Even if you're not sure, just put it in. Yep. You know, just kind of like just finishing, like the, you know, the PowerShell gallery documentation uh, has been open source in the last year. Uh, and finally, you know, the, the homepage, which is becoming sort of the central point of gravity where people go to to actually find information about PowerShell and resources associated with PowerShell. Yeah, hundreds of thousands yeah. of uh, views on that thing these yeah. days. We have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, so don't. So, we, so, hold that thought. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think there is a, there is something about that that we want to go yes. and address as well. In the in the usage, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, we just recently did a survey. One of the things that it really was a huge highlight for us, we didn't know until this information came to us. 93% of IT administrators are, who are managing servers are using PowerShell in one form or another. I mean, that is an amazing job. I mean. Think about the PowerShell, you know, just, uh, uh, it's been around for now almost 11 years since really sure. went into mainstream. But really the last three, four years, they've been just amazing. It's I mean, we, inevitable. Everybody yeah, knows it's, uh, wherever it. we go, the amount of user groups is another in great indicator of kind of where we start seeing the growth of the, the technology. WMF, uh, the, the, I mean, 7.3 million downloads is pretty amazing numbers. The gallery, 2.2 million downloads per month with over 2,000 unique users per, um, with modules and scripts. The contributors, I mean, it's down yeah, to 1,400. What, 18 months old? Yeah. Max two years, so just, the, the ramp is pretty damn quick. I just have a big side pool that goes and downloads those for you guys to get your numbers up higher. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully everybody's doing the set now. Well, and it's true, the downloads aren't a, an exact yeah. measure. In fact, some people download and then they broadcast it, <laughs> um, but it's an, it's one of the indicators. Yeah. Between the 93% and the, and the ramping downloads. Yeah. One you know, those. one number that is not here that actually caught my attention in the uh, PowerShell Summit in North America, we had actually some of our partners like Puppet that were in the conference. One of the things that they announced that the PowerShell module that they use for actually use DSC into Windows, that thing got downloaded over 10 million times. And I was just blown away by that number. It's like, wow. I mean, it's just info. things that it's not really telling us, you know, the story. The story is that you and uh, all the people up there is really using PowerShell in ways that, you know, we never thought. Uh, so pretty amazing. And one more slide on this kind of notion. It says, and this is, um, it's a little, how do I, I, it's hard to read that one. But um, if you take a look at uh, this, this is actually PowerShell 4, and you have PowerShell 5, and, there were, and these are all starting essentially at the same time, so you get sort of the delta and the ramp. And what you see is a factor of two, right? <laughs> essentially, PowerShell 5, 5 5.1 is going about twice as fast as yeah. PowerShell 5. By the way, as a quick caveat, remember PowerShell 5.0 yeah. is a, Force replaced by 5.1 within a certain number of months. So don't yep. forget that. Make sure you have input. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, again, I think this is uh, information really telling us, especially the team, you know, the, the uses of PowerShell is growing across all the different channels from WMF to the PowerShell gallery, as well as resources. I mean, so there is definitely a pretty strong moment, and I think we start seeing the hockey stick, like we like to call, That's of right. the usage. So, very, very important. They, in the community, you know, first of all, we got to say thank you because it's really you who make PowerShell what it is today. Uh, it's the people using it every day, who is helping each other, it's the conversations that you have in the hallways, it's the way how you go back to the companies and, you know, either through the user groups that you're creating and you and your regions, or by being in the Stack Overflow, you talk about PowerShell, or basically just doing simple things like sharing, you know, in PS Talk or in other areas you know, help each other and how, you know, PowerShell is actually being used. It's, this is it's all of us for us as that as the community. That's really the contributions. 
So, speaking of contributions. Yeah, speaking of contributions, so we're going to start highlighting every year, you know, our top contributors in the community. Here is a list of people who in the last year, either through documentation uh, or code or resources, you know, has participated uh, basically in the community. And that we want to highlight them because the community is telling us, look, these persons are making a difference. Either, you know, like from June Blender and the PS script analyzer around help. Totally. That's been a lot of the, the, the amazing work that she's been doing through Ryan the last King, years. Also non-FT. Ryan, yeah. The, Daniel Scott with the DSC resources, another big uh, thanks to so, them. This is just representative, by the way. We know that. We know there's a lot more going on. We just do want to reach out and at least say thank you to a few people for their, you know, kind of above and beyond the contribution. It doesn't include everybody, but it's just, it, we truly really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, we had a small... Uh, pick that list next year. Oh, we're going to talk Wait, about Wait, dude. Yeah. Ah, you're like one slide. Jeez. Right, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, so one of the things that, that we want to introduce starting next year is the concept that we want you, the community, to vote to us only who is going to be our PowerShell hero. Right? We want basically uh, the community to start basically voting for the people who's actually helping you, you know, to make a difference. Right? It's through documentation, it's through some uh, resources that you write, it's through co contributions into the code base, right? because you're helping us to actually fix bugs or come up with some new ideas. That's kind of how we want to start recognizing uh, individuals who have like that contribution. And we'll post the ways to actually yeah. do that vote here on the yeah. blog and Twitter and so everybody knows about it. Yeah. All right. So Enough about you, now about us. Yeah, so we're going to shift a little bit the gears. Uh, one of the things that I think is important for us is to kind of give you a Microsoft update in a way about how the company is making changes internally, how those changes uh, reflect into the work that we do, how we think of that work. It's going to work that it's going to help you know the technologies you use for automation and management in the future so one of the things that really came together was like hey look it came up very obvious to to us that we needed sort of to bring the things together that were working in very common technologies right we had Azure automation Azure configuration we have powershell we have dsc we realized that the synergy it was pretty clear i mean Azure automation the Azure configuration is based on powershell and dsc Right, so think about one is the platform, one is the services, other solutions. So it kind of makes sense to bring those worlds together. At the same time, you know, the enterprise cloud group there, it was responsible for the uh, for Windows Server and for management for the on-prem business, including Azure Stack. We thought it was a good time uh, to move that organization as a whole into the Azure uh, organization. So now PowerShell, all of us, uh, we are part of the Azure team. If that, if by merging the DSC team and the Azure Automation team, we created a new team that's called the Azure Configuration Management and Automation. It is really focused on the hybrid cloud. So when you look in the team, just to give you the names, you know, for you familiar, obviously you know Jeffrey. So Richard Jeffrey is Jeffrey. basically now the technical fellow uh, for Azure Management and Azure Stack. And uh, we have Jeremy Winter, who is the director of PN for OMS, and now his portfolio is about Azure Management. And responsible for the PM team, the Azure, Azure configuration services and automation. It includes the platform, DSC, as well as PowerShell. And, and this this alludes to something that's kind of interesting because we used to report directly into Windows Server, right? And that was a little different. That's how we monetize PowerShell. How, how do we get the excuse to what we doing? You have to have somebody who's actually paying your salary. Windows Server was the one that paid it. Now, as we shifted, and you'll see this in the other pivot, just future looking, mm -hmm. we shifted to Azure first, partly because, well, we should. And also because our vice president is now part of Azure, right? And so now the focus says, okay, how do we deeply embed ourselves into the Azure tier zero? How do we make sure they succeed and how we make sure we bring the Azure services and you guys are actually able to take advantage of it? And by the way, it doesn't preclude us in any way, shape or form from continuing the uh, the awesome Windows and Linux, you know, based PowerShell experience. So it's just worth highlighting, hmm. I think that. Can I add to that? So the thing about Azure is by definition, Azure is cross-platform. That is the That's mission right. of Azure, to be the trusted provider for all of your workloads, whatever they're running on. So this is a great alignment with that. You know, in reality, we were executing on that. We're executing on that within the Windows Server organization. So here we have you know, full you know, alignment all the way up the chain. <laughs> the second thing is, notice we've now combined that Azure, or sorry, PowerShell, which is kind of sort of a platform technology, with the solutions, Azure Automation, Azure Configuration. And so this is the thing I was mentioned that we're shifting focus from just focusing 
in on the platform, and now also focusing in on solutions. And of course, as we so modify solutions or more strategic solutions, the platform gets updated. Yeah. So the, the overall portfolio, so now if you have questions about any of these technologies moving forward, you know who to go to, <laughs> who to send mail to. And so basically we brought PowerShell and DSC for all the platforms that we support, Windows, Azure, Linux, open source, Azure automation and configuration services. This, this includes chain, config, update and patching. That's a part uh, of OMS, people are familiar yeah. with that. I got a few questions about that. That was the old OMS piece. Yeah. Uh, the PowerShell GitHub projects, uh, the tools and the galleries, uh, the WinRN and OpenSSH, and finally, uh, the DevOps management scenarios that we're going to be supporting in the future. So what, why, so what did all this mean? Why we did this together? So here is something that is becoming really interesting for, for the industry, some of these transformations that are really happening. When you're looking into sort of the life cycle of how you are made in your uh, enterprises and your environments, one of the things that is becoming really common is that we see Azure Automation and PowerShell as the central pivot in how you bring this life cycle together. From the time that you build things, by the time you actually configure them, you monitor, you protect them, security and govern, in all those part of the life cycle, you need automation. So for us, we start realizing that if we want to do things like orchestration, we want to be able to do things like policy management, governance, it's really important to actually use automation as the vehicle to enable that. If we want to do it both, not only just from a, a, a simple you know, a scripting and jobs, but we actually want to do it from the policy management and configuration of those policies through DSC. So that is start becoming sort of the, the new way for us to think into solutions. To Jeffrey's point, think about all these different solutions and how we're going to be participating with the PowerShell to enable these solutions to be real. So in the Azure Automation and Configuration portfolio, if you see it, the investments that we've been making, especially in the last year, that we're going to be making moving forward, PowerShell and DSC, they are like the integral components that enable these experiences. So these are the solutions that we are building. The reason why these solutions are becoming more and more critical, because they scale in the cloud, they are super reliable, they do hybrid management, and they work out across different clouds. So if you have an AWS cloud, you have an Azure cloud, if you have a Google cloud, our goal is that we want to enable these technologies to really easily integrate. So, and then when you build your solutions, you build the solutions on top of the sort of what we call our platform, it now enables you to do this integration, this sort of delivery of these sort of capabilities into the overall PowerShell, what I would call a- And a few other theories will try to also make it a little easier, smoother on-ramp into Azure and some of those capabilities. Right now, there's, there's kind of a, 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 yeah. a learning curve in some of these technologies we'd like to like to diminish anyway. Absolutely. Missions. Well, our mission remains the same. It's the same. Right? Best platform across yeah. cross platform tool to manage the hybrid cloud. We now just have sort of a different perspective and as Jeffrey pointed out, sort of the permission and the organizational support to really land the uh, cross. In fact, as we've talked about a lot of the planning, there's a real push to actually say, look, we need to almost start doing Linux first just to make sure we get it right. Does that make sense? Pivot. Now, it's yeah. not because we're not going to do Windows, but it's like, how do we pivot from all the stuff we know on Windows mm -hmm. through to Linux? How do we get that? So, Absolutely. cross platform, I think, is a big It is a big thing. thing. Yeah, I think that this goes also with the transformation comment from Jeffrey. It's not just about you transforming, we are transforming ourselves as well within Microsoft. Right. I mean, for us, it's, we got to start thinking about Linux, is, is basically the same as Windows. And if we think about it even internally from a cultural perspective, we are shifting that. Now, the engineering team, the PM teams, the thinking that when you build a feature, it's a feature for the cross plot. It's not, oh, we're going to do it for Windows. It's like, oh, yeah, eventually we'll get it into Linux. That's completely changing culturally in the company. And so we are going through this transformation. This transformation is like any others. It takes time. But now I feel that when we chain a PowerShell, especially about a year ago, to be an open source at Linux, this transformation now is paying our dividends. Now we start seeing actually changing. We start seeing the velocity increasing. So I think I'm pretty, uh, pretty optimistic kind of yep. where we're going. So let's talk a little bit about the roadmap. So PowerShell actually is a technology that is shipping in multiple places. It ships in Windows, it ships in Azure, it ships in open source, and eventually I think it, start, it will be delivered by other community uh, members. So in the, in the near future, we have a Potassium, which is the Azure release vehicle that will release around the June timeframe, Calcium, which is the next Azure release that will happen by the end of the year. 
So Azure releases twice a year. So that, those are the nicknames that we use uh, to sort of highlight the, the scope of the work that we're going to be doing. So DSC is a native uh, Azure configuration. This is a big investment that we are making. And we, we're doing it for two reasons. One is that you have ARM, which is a very clear configuration in Azure around the infrastructure. Then you use DSC as the Inges configuration technology. So we bring in those two, uh, two technologies together. So when you build in a configuration service, you can actually now configure end to end all the your resources, both from an infrastructure, if from a resource, as well as to the Inges and the components and the Inges. So now we are completing that story with DSC. Yeah, and it, a key element here, which we'll hit a little bit when we talk about the LCM update for a few moments um, is, hey, look, we also got to make sure we're deeply embedded in what we call the tier zero or tier one of Azure. So they're all sort of cross-dependent on it. Does that make sense? So as soon as you get that deep dependency built in on the online future of Microsoft services, then again, you have this, this impetus to get, get the right things done across the board. Okay. So that's part of a key strategy yeah. on our part, just from the- A couple of other things to highlight. Yeah, go ahead. So is your intent to replace the JSON template completely with DSC? No, 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 no. no. That's no. One, the, the intent is the JSON template should easily integrate with the DSC, should okay. be able to call DSC easily from inside of that JSON template. Yeah. Right now it's a little clunky. It'd be nice to have a much smoother experience across the infrastructure. And then maybe over time, there'll be some DSL that would lay our, on top of ARM but that would be, you know, something futuristic that we would we would consider. Just how do you make that whole whole stack smooth so you can get from the infrastructure? To Correct. Smooth? A couple of other things to highlight there is the the PowerShell uh, cloud command line. Uh, so as part of bringing that PowerShell experience into Azure, you will have. Yeah, we're going to demo that later. So, but we're going to yeah, actually demo. Actually, it's running PowerShell in in, in the Azure portal. So that is ca is coming up uh, pretty quickly. Patching, uh, one of the things that, that we start realizing, especially around policy management, patching is a big pain for all of the customers, especially when you start thinking about cross platform how you patch Linux, how you patch Windows. So one of the solutions that we are actually delivering uh, within the, uh, actually next week will go private preview. So if any of you wants to try it, let me know. Uh, within the next three months, it's actually a complete patching solution for both Linux and Windows. And that, solution will provide you both things. One is a reporting capability. We'll tell you what things are out of compliance and what kind of patches are required. Second, it will allow you to do maintenance windows. You actually be able to do patching in a scheduled basis. So it's pretty awesome. And we actually, it's all based on a PowerShell. Again, it's a PowerShell DSC solution. And I know many of you have built sort of similar solutions internally in your company. I think that this is trying to really kind of bring this sort of holistic hybrid view uh, of patching into a single solution. So it's pretty awesome. And these two are sort of the two, you know, the twin elements of the Windows. How do we handle the Windows and the Microsoft stack? Mm -hmm. We'll actually keep contributing there. There's RS3, which comes out later this yeah, year. Later this year. Yeah. And then there's PowerShell 6, which is sort of both Linux and Windows and will ship open source. And there's a question that says, you know, how are we actually going to put like right, ship vehicles for this stuff? But we're sort of working through that now. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I think one thing also, if you're thinking about the, hopefully you start seeing what is happening, right? PowerShell start releasing in all these different places. You release in Azure, you release in Windows, you start releasing in the open source. So one of the things that we are figuring out that we haven't really uh, completely finished the plan is how are we going to bring the innovation in a consistent base, right? So the code bases are start becoming one single code base, either we can provide supported versions of PowerShell. With PowerShell 6, they will start working across all these different platforms. So in the near future, that's kind of what we are trying to address, that you'll have one version of PowerShell that you can take from the gallery, either you can install in all these different platforms, Linux, Windows, or the cloud, either you can actually rely on it, they will be able to actually more quickly be able to innovate and instead of being tied to a release vehicle. Because when you are in Windows, it takes about six months right. to actually release innovation. With PowerShell 6, you know, you get in the bill every day, right? So it's a big difference. In the community, I think the, uh, one of the things, I don't know, if, how many of you use a scripting guy? So you probably know that Ed Wilson retired uh, recently. Uh, and so Ed was working on my organization. Uh, one of the things that he actually told me was, look, I'm retiring. Uh, so what are we gonna do with a scripting guy? Like, wow. Scripting guys, it's been a great tool. It has helped a lot of people, you know, to get in started with PowerShell. It, build, it basically writes some blocks that it's been helping the community, you know, in different topics. So one of the things that he told me is like, 
Maybe you should start thinking more about no scripting guys, just thinking about more about scripting guys. Let the community basically start running the blogs, have two or three main people that maintains basically the blogs. It help the community by adding editing basically capabilities so we can curate the content and be able to publish that content on your behalf. So that is something that we start thinking that we're gonna start introducing in the near future. So it will help you to write blogs, we'll curate them and then we'll publish them in, uh, for you. Uh, the gallery, this is gonna be a continued investment for us. We're gonna do more of the, uh, it's a, the sort of the central repository for the community resources. And we uh, make it a little smarter about how to contribute um, DSC configurations into that space. Right now you have a tendency to use a lot of DSC resources which are useful, but configurations BKS leverage those resources to maybe do a SharePoint deployment or, or one of your you know, DNS deployments, whatever it is you want to get done, right? And so how do you actually leverage some of this? So we're, we're continuing to look at how we make the gallery more, more effective. Yep. We're pretty happy with it, but it's it, we can do more. Yeah, yeah. I think also we want to integrate the PowerShell gallery uh, with Azure as well, so you can That's actually right. start surfacing those resources through the Azure experience. Yeah, we so want an ARM template that actually married with the DSC config. Exactly. So to set up a whole yeah. farm of something that would be an example of that kind of yeah. opportunity. Uh, some open items that we have enclosed, just to be transparent with you. So WMF is actually has been an interesting challenge for us because it primarily has been used for down-level versions of Windows. So the question is, what do we do for Linux? What do we do for the cloud? So we start realizing the WMF in the current form is not going to work for us in the future because it has a dependency into WMI. It has a dependency to some of the technologies in Windows that in the future we want to actually remove that dependency. It's still, you know, it's an optional component that you can actually use, but we want to sort of separate that dependency so we can actually release builds of DSC and PowerShell as a standalone builds that you can install and they will work down level. But they will work down level as a standard, you know, bill of that particular component versus a package of multiple technologies that they sort of depend on each other. So we sort of going to try to sort of clean up a little bit that sort of boundary. Sort of tease that apart, and make it a, a lot smaller. Right? Yeah. right now, WMF is humongous because it's got all the WMI and WSMAN and a bunch of other stuff, which is great. So we should have done before. Kind of want to get away from that model now if we can. And it's surprising how deeply entrenched and embedded some yep. of these hooks get with the whole Windows process. So this extraction takes a little bit, well, it takes a little while to figure out how to replace, but we got we to do something there. Yeah. Um, DevOps solutions, we have ideas now. We don't have plans yet. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to do something in the DevOps yeah. space. That's our yeah. official plan, do something. So <laughs> we're trying to figure out what that something might look like and hopefully by PowerShell Asia, we'll have a a pretty concrete view of that, but right now we're, we're still playing with it and, uh, and working through the possibilities. Uh, the same thing about configuration service, I think the, uh, we know that we are going to build a set of configuration services. That is pretty clear. I think it's, there's something about orchestration of configurations. We know that this is something that we're going to enable. The question is, how are we going to do it and when we're going to do it? That's kind of, so we still have it really close. I think it's today I'm in a better place than a month ago because a month ago is when we wrote these particular items. But I think now, uh, I think we're close to a plan and how this is going to work. There's nothing for the PowerShell action services. I think the right. The idea simply says, hey, how would it make it really easy for you to once you're in Azure, just go launch a PowerShell script against all your VMs, right? You have a subscription. I want to just ask you, okay, I want to launch this. You know, my my whatever it is, stop process for this crazy process that's running crazy across all my VMs. How do I how do I do that? How do I schedule it? Right? It should be a pretty simple fill out a form kind of a kind of a process that's not written. So there's that kind mm -hmm. of integration we'll start trying to do just to make it easy for you to integrate both the PowerShell experience and the uh, and the Azure experience. You know? yep. yep. Any questions by the way about that roadmap? Yeah. It makes sense. Anything that you see there that is missing? Okay, good. I just want to pause there for a sec. Okay, all right. I know that this has been a, a topic, right? I mean, I've been reading the blogs on Twitter, and I just want to be sure that we land. Yes, go ahead. So, Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So yes, we are building a Swagger uh, out of gen for command lines. Uh, and that is right now, current the plan is gonna be in the potassium timeframe. That's what we're gonna, now, I wanna, we're gonna release it first internally. 
we want to be sure that the first party services can actually generate these commandlets. And now where we are trying to figure out from a release vehicle is when we're going to make it available for a community, like open sources. Of we haven't closed on that yet, but we'll deliver it internally, uh, like the Python with uh, June. So let me, July, let, me little, let me get a little pointy on what that is, because the way you said it, I wasn't quite sure that we'd landed perhaps what it was correct. Um, we're, there's a bunch of REST APIs that Azure exposes in order to manage itself. We're going to have those teams across Azure generate Swagger documents, which is sort of a text thing, it's YAML-based uh, description of what that REST API looks like. With the REST API and the Swagger, we will auto-generate a set of commands. Similar to the O data, but, yep. but hopefully done a little even better. And then the next step says, okay, so that's kind of where we're headed. And, and, and we have working stuff, but there's still, you know, some edges where, you know, how, we, we still have to work through some of that. So there'll be, so we're going to make sure it works first for all the Azure REST APIs. And then we've got that covered and we have a process. And then as on Hell said, we can reflect on, okay, how do we make sure that we can make it available to you guys? So you and REST APIs, you'll have not get that capability. Yeah. We had a question here too. Um, I think it's thing for the rest of the world. I've spent the last few days getting my whole breath around it, going from Windows PowerShell 5.1 to 6. And now it's, it's starting to be clear to me that I think we need to be really, really clear when we go out and sell PowerShell 6 that this is not a downgrade from Windows PowerShell because some yes. might see this yeah. No, it's a good point. I know that Joy has been working in sort of the messaging because it's definitely, I mean, I think that there's been uh, sort of this perception that what we are building with Core CLR is an inferior version of PowerShell. And actually what I see is actually the opposite. I think it's actually a, it's actually a superior version of PowerShell because it enables us now to actually do a cross-platform and cross-cloud. Yeah, I think the, the question now is that will everything that I have invested in the last three, four years with PowerShell, will it still work in PowerShell 6? If the intent is yes, we'll, I'm sure we'll have bugs. That is no question. Yeah, I think that the move to a standard two of that net, I think it's going to help us with actually, you know, the coverage to be addressed. Well, so that's, that, that, I just wanted that to be really synced because I think the, uh, are, we are not going to go basically jeopardize something that has always been, you know, especially for Jeffrey, it's always been very clear. The interoperability, you know, is you, you, scripting interop is super, super important. We don't want to break the language. We are not going to go and break the syntax of PowerShell because we're moving into a PowerShell 6. Now, for Linux, the experience, we may need to do some things that they are very specific with for Linux, and we'll do so. It will be very clear about why we're doing them. But it should be a compliment, it has to be like, we are going to break Windows experience in order to deliver a Linux experience. We may need to deliver in the builds that we build for a particular distro, something that is really specifically to address that community. That's so that is kind of the, the way how we are thinking, uh, how PowerShell 6 and future versions of PowerShell, PowerShell will be sort of built. And it's true that, and it's true that not all commandlets that used to work on Windows PowerShell necessarily work on PowerShell 6. Although .NET standard 2.0, we actually think it's going to be a much, much higher percentage than what it looked like. So we're actually really happy about that. We're looking forward as that comes out to find out how close we came. But it's also worth noting that as the industry has shifted a little bit um, towards managing the cloud, that in fact PowerShell 6 lights up strongest there because that's where you have REST-based APIs or JSON or other types of things mm -hmm. coming back to you, right? One of our one of our prime customers actually had it, but we gave him PowerShell 6 early, like last year, uh, summer of last year actually, and they ran through a, a set of uh, configurations that they actually wanted to do, a whole series of scripts like this 4,000 line, 6,000 line script, and it turned out they had to change like five lines in or something and actually make it work yeah. on Linux. So all of a sudden, because that were they were focused on managing a service as opposed to the local mm -hmm. box. So yeah. we'll have some deficits, but I think there's yeah. a lot of, a lot of forward looking. And it, you know, it related to that, I mean, uh, some of our partners, VMware, AWS, as well as uh, Google, they using PowerShell 6. 
they actually they went and they actually they were some of the first early adopters. Oh, they're pushing us. And who basically they started taking their existing commandlets and moving those commandlets to work on Linux. So through that journey, they ha has helped actually make PowerShell, in my opinion, actually stronger. And so by then betting on PowerShell 6 and start feeling more confident, they, as you start making the transition, it will be an easier transition than it could have been. And talking about PowerShell 6, uh, we already talked about the objectives. What's cool is our beta one. I think we just should actually come out next week. Yep. And do land on it. Do play with it just a little bit. Um, we noticed that in October we had a lot of people land on it. It's kind of diminished a bit. Just try it. Kick the tires. Tell us how bad it is. You guys do end up driving it depending upon the issues you have. We're either going to fix them or not. But in fact, it's a very public process about how we fix them. And we have a list, a public list of which ones we expect to fix before we think we're ready to go to production. So you know, look at that list, look at the product, give us feedback, because in many ways it will be somewhat determined by the feedback we get from the community when we actually decide to, uh, to finish it yeah. off and release. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Uh, well, I think uh, the, the only thing just to add, uh, so the remote experience will start becoming a native experience both for WSMAN as well as for OpenSSH. Uh, OpenSSH as well will be releasing in Windows. So as, as we start moving into RS3, which is the next version, you'll have basically, uh, as part of uh, the Windows releases, you'll have OpenSSH built in. So that will sort of make the whole transition into the remote management from uh, Windows box to Linux, you know, much easier. Um, let's see, yeah, those are the, the big ones. Yeah. DSC. DSC. Um, so let's talk just a little bit about where desired state configuration is. If you were at Bruce's session, you heard some of this feel before, but, um, Basically, there are a series of features and fixes coming actually in Windows Server RS3. And again, how that goes down level is still TBD. Um, they are lighting up particularly key scenarios in the Azure automation um, and configuration yeah. space. Includes monitor only mode, certificate renewal, proxy uh, support, all those are great yeah. things. As we said before, we have shifted a bit with DSC to prioritize the cloud and Azure first. And here's what that means. This is why it's a little tricky. Um, LCM, the local configuration manager, you all familiar with what that is a little bit, right? It's the agent that sits there on the target machine and makes it so, whatever you say the configuration should be. Um, and what we've realized is that we're gonna embed this thing at the deepest level of the Azure stack and it's not ready and it won't take us to the, to the future that we need to go. We need to enable more side by side if you take a look at it, we need to allow this gentleman and that gentleman and that lady over there to go and make changes, um, kind of independent of each other, but in a way that's coordinated, right? So we have to have the conflict resolver. Mm -hmm. So we know, okay, oops, there's, you know, Bob is stepping on Joe's toes, so that won't work, right? We'll prevent that configuration getting run, or we'll notify people that, it, that, it, that there's toe stepping, right? That's the whole key. But we still want to have N of these, so you could bring your own LCM as you need to, Manage it on the time frame you need to. This is a brief example. One of the things that people were trying to do at one point was they had a set of security checks and they wanted to do the checks every five or six seconds, right? And if you take a look at partial configs, you could technically kind of say, I want to run at a different refresh rate, but the guy who's running five or six seconds is going to take up all the time, right? There's never a free place for the other guy to insert his every 30 second check or every three minute check or every 30 minute check. It just never got run. Um, and so we said, no, we're not going to deal with handling process conflicts. Let's just let the OS deal with that, all right? And let's create the LCM as independent library. So it'll be a library. It'll be very lightweight. Right now, it's a fairly heavyweight. It depends on OMI. Uh, we'll, we'll remove, and or WMI, we'll remove mm -hmm. that uh, dependency. Um, and we'll probably even have a very, very lightweight, perhaps even just a shim, which lets you actually bootstrap to the higher level capability. Lowest level might just say, I have a known set of resources I can manage, that's all I can do. And then I can bootstrap to next level more generic. So just some, just some ideas um, yeah. that will give us a great deal of capabilities, uh, of what we think. And last but not least, um, as we go to the cloud, we don't want everybody to have to, to redeploy the LCM on a regular basis. Rather, it should uh, update itself from a known location. Um, so we'll have a self-updatable LCM. We'll be able to say, okay, I, it's time for my agent mm -hmm. to get updated, right? It's an agent. It's not a, it's 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 not a not a solution. So it should just update itself automatically when it needs to. Bug fixes will push down. So I think that'll be 
also highly valuable for people yeah. to make it a much more uh, productive um, yeah. opportunity. And I think one thing also to highlight in that particular is that you'll be able to do things like, let's say you have your own gallery internally within your company, so if you want to maintain you know, different versions of configurations, LCMs, you will be able to manage that. And then you self-update mechanism, it will be inextensible. So you can actually download updates a different central gallery, or you can do it internally as well. So I think that's going to be kind of, even for PowerShell, that's one of the things that we've been thinking is that we want to make sort of PowerShell to be self-update, right? So I think we're going to start with uh, the LCM, but I think eventually we want to do the same thing for PowerShell right. to help us to actually do more of these sort of frequent updates of the technology, if being able to actually reduce the footprint, especially when you start moving to things like containers, it start becoming very important to actually reduce that footprint. And these cables are going to go out gradually, just to be clear. Now, the re and they'll, they'll first embed it in Azure, and they'll provide more broadly. And the thing that is worth getting in focus is that um, because we're doing this work, there are a few things like maintenance windows and intermediate state and a few other type of capabilities that we're not going to be able to work on as soon as we would like to. So from an external standpoint, it might look like we're not investing in DSC for a little while. The opposite is true. We're actually doubling down on DSC. We're just plumbing it deeper and actually having to sort of step back a little bit so I can come over and go on a much, go on the freeway yep. instead of on like the city street, right? So this is the, okay, take some time, get on the freeway on ramp and now we can go. So that's kind of the, uh, the place we're at on it. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, DevOps. Uh, let's see, first, um, and we did, we spent like an hour on it. It was good fun, at least I enjoyed it. Um, and we spent another hour with a QA and a uh, discussion at PowerShell North America, some with 90 people, including Amazon Web Services, Google, just discussing the challenges. The key point that I want to highlight is it's going to happen. It's absolutely real, and as was tweeted about, it's either going to happen with you or to you, mm -hmm. so we prefer it to happen with you, so let's make sure it's a, it's a successful experience for you. One could argue it's already <laughs> happening. Well, it is very much happening. It, that's it, why it, it is. is real. Um, we well, think you're probably hitting, in fact, we would assert that um, we're probably at the place where we're just beginning to get into what we call the early majority of the market phase, which are companies that are actually not completely high risk companies are now saying, okay, I have a clear business advantage. They're business driven, not technology driven, clear business advantage that I've got to take advantage of, or I'm going to be in trouble. In fact, we talked to a few companies and they have, they're having what I call an existential crisis, meaning they're trying to say, in order for myself to exist, I am going to have to figure out this DevOps thing because my competitor is moving too fast. Right. Um, and that goes, that goes exactly what it is. You have, if you have a company that's going, their deployments are running 200 times quicker than you, right? And, and so let that ponder, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And their lead time from customer request to fix is 2,555 times faster. That's not a typo, right? It's commas are real. And they recover 24 times faster. Guess who's going to win in a head-to-head -head competition? You know, now you might be able to escape. I do have a, a caveat. If your org mm -hmm. is not impacted by technology or mm -hmm. by competition, <laughs> perhaps your government, then you don't. <laughs> then, um, okay, maybe it doesn't apply to you, but everybody else it applies to. It's, it's coming for you. So get on board, get it figured out. Um, you know, again, one of the things I want to just tell you a very quick story about a, a real case. So everybody knows Target. Okay. So Target went through this transformation pretty rapidly. Why? They were basically put in a very difficult place when hackers stole the identity of many of their customers. It this created a pretty amazing chain inside the company. They start basically shifting to DevOps very quickly. If by shifting to DevOps very quickly, they start basically realizing that these numbers that Kenneth has displayed is becoming a reality. They can move faster. They were basically realizing that they became actually leading in the industry and, and start basically providing their competitors now a reason for them to start shifting. So and then other companies like Walmart, Nostrum, start basically shifting to DevOps because they realized they were getting behind because Target they was moving so fast about making these sort of changes and having this sort of impact in customers. So that gives you an idea that once somebody in the industry takes off, 
the other companies that need to follow, to yeah, your yeah, point. Sure. Otherwise, you're going to get behind. And this is start be, uh, we start observing this a lot in the industry. Yeah, I think it's going to start becoming the, the new real. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's kind of like when Amazon Web Services had PowerShell commandlets and Azure didn't. So yeah. Jeffrey yeah, sent exactly. a small email yeah. to the yeah. Azure guys going, <laughs> Hey, what's happening here? And we'll see see Satya just in case it's unclear, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, I better get on board. <laughs> so, um, sorry, I have a small uh, formatting problem. Ignore this. This should be up a little bit. Anyway, um, so how do you get started with this? And we should spend we can spend a fair bit of time on how to get started, particularly in an organization. Uh, we're not going to do that here, but that's the, the but the first piece of it. The first piece of it is find people that are willing create the coalition of the willing, right? They exist. Mm -hmm. There are other people as crazy as you out there. Witness everyone here, but they also exist in your company. So find the other one or two or three people that you can actually partner with to do something. The second key piece is, this is all gonna be a very results-driven business decision process over time. We're leveraging technology, but it's gonna be a business decision. And so what you need to do is to find an impactful project. What project we were most impacted by fast deployments, shorter lead times, higher recovery, right? You want to find that project that will uh, showcase it best. You solve the problem, and then, in fact, you showcase it up, right? And then what happens, we had some discussion over lunch about that. And then what happens is, you know, that your boss or somebody's boss starts looking pretty good, right? And the other guy says, well, how come he's doing so good? And then they'll, they'll find us. So it's just a question of bootstrap. Now, that said, um, it's nicest because there's also organizational changes to do in DevOps. If you have your CIO or CTO or someone else uh, providing lots of air cover and time to explore. Um, and there are indications that uh, these people are starting to hear about it. So actually we hear, I'm about 50-50 in terms of the experiences I hear where it's bottoms up or tops down and posed um, because they're starting to talk to each other about the, uh, about the experience. <laughs> uh, they say we have an hour. That means so. we have 15 more minutes. Um, so um, keep that in mind. And also, this is just fun. There is some way cool technology happening here. We went through it, I say, during our hour. You got flighting, you got kill switches, you have some AI stuff to decide when you should promote from one ring of customers to another ring of customers to a third ring of customers. How can you automatically determine if you're succeeding or you should pull back? How do you automatically inject the intelligence into? Is the customer actually leveraging the feature? Is it not? Um, these ideas of flighting allow you to deploy the bits to everybody, and then you have a simple configuration to turn them off or on. This is part of how you get to 24 times faster recovery. You're not rolling new bits out. You're just, you're just making a config change, and it, just, it flows smoothly through the system. So there's opportunities. The key point is that DevOps is a transformational change, and I was amused that Jeffrey spent so much time on transformation on Monday, uh, Tuesday rather, which is great. And if you think of that talk and then apply it here, you're, you've got the right mindset. It is a transformational change. Enjoy it. Reedy, this is an exciting time. It's as exciting as, op I would say as rich with opportunity as it was when we went from GUIs to PowerShell. All right, now you're going PowerShell, DevOps. So get your head around it, play with it, it'll be fun. Predictions. So, future predictions. This is the obvious oh, yeah. one. We just right. said it. <laughs> We're going to do something yeah. in DevOps. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> no, we're definitely going to do it specifically around the automation and configuration. I mean, oh, I know that this is, this is actually really important because uh, when you're thinking about immutable infrastructures like containers, people think it's like, well, you don't need configuration, you don't need automation, everything is just sort of. Yeah, I think at the end, it's actually completely the opposite. You may not configure the container when it's actually running in the cloud, but you still got to configure the container images and how that container is actually going to be monitored and how it's going to be in compliance or not with a new company. That, you still got to be able to configure those parameters, you know, in build time. So I think one of the things that we start realizing is part of the, sort of the pipeline. We're thinking about this concept of continuous management. You, you got to start basically from the moment the developer is running those solutions and how those solutions are meeting or not the requirements of the company from a policy perspective. If that is declarative, if this is going to be the way how you declare and code those particular uh, sort of what I would call 
constraints in how, how you're going to monitor those constraints and how automation is going to let you know that, by the way, you know, there is something that has changed in your environment or things that they are knowing compliance and what kind of remediations you got to go take. And stuff so even as simple as like the idea of your update service, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, it turns out that people do need updates, they need patches. It's just that it doesn't happen after it's deployed. It happens in the pipeline. It happens in the pipeline before yep. as you're actually building the darn image, how you're building the right image, how do you get that stuff inserted. So that's kind of the way to think about yep. it. It's going to happen after or before, but it's still got to happen. There's no... Uh, the editor services that will support the PowerShell development. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. This is just... And we've got... Uh, uh, Keith and others working on it. Now. You know what that, I don't know if you know what that means, but it's like, uh, just to be super clear, it's about, you know, today, you know, like, uh, we want to actually make PowerShell sort of a really DevOps language. You know how you accomplish that, you got to think about the whole development and how that language needs to participate from the moment that you build, how you test, how you validate, how you deploy it, and then how you maintain it. So when you're thinking about the whole operations, if you will, that what we want to do is that the VS Code actually ties into that particular chain and enables things like diagnostics, debugging, testing, validation. You want to bring all that as part of the Visual yeah, Studio Code. Even just, uh, he's got it sooner, soon to go out. Actually, he starts handling the alias of uh, uh, conversions. To yeah, so things. We're getting some of the script analyzer yeah. type of stuff actually embedded in there so you can have some great experiences. And this stuff flows back, I believe, into ISC as well, yeah. or it can flow into Sublime or something else as you want to. VSP yeah, I don't know about what I say, but I'm sure Sublime will. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, we've talked about a, a little bit yep. ad nauseum already, but it simply says we're going to get deeply embedded. Right? Yep. We're going down to the, the metal so we can't get removed, and so we can provide high value. Yep. Uh, we think that once PowerShell 6.0 is production ready, the next thing for us is to basically get it into these drugs. Uh, and so. I think that, you know, there were some good conversations that we had last year. Jeffrey, I remember, has some, uh, I think it was with Red Hat, with Canonical. And I think one of the things that we need to go and do now is to say, well, when we have a PowerShell 6 that is ready for production, next step, let's connect with the distros, if you should send their catalogs, you start basically being supported by their particular, you know, community. So, I would say it's surprising how welcoming the Linux community actually has been. <laughs> you know, we thought there might be some... Yeah. <laughs> By comparison to our expectations, which were low, <laughs> I would say that they've been, yeah, they've actually been pretty welcoming. They've been pretty, oh, thank you for joining the party. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Not everyone. Yeah. <laughs> we send them Jeffrey's way. <laughs> That's right. No, but in general, it's been pretty, it's been pretty surprising to me. I hadn't expected that, uh, that reasonable uptake. Yeah. And even the distro vendors, as soon as they heard about it, they came open really mm -hmm. fast and said, hey, look, we want to work with you on it. And Linus Tolos came to the Microsoft booth. He took a picture with us because he was like, he felt he can congratulate us. I remember he's like, yeah, congratulations on PowerShell on Linux. I think that's great. And we were like, wow, who would have thought? You know, two years ago. <laughs> so, no, uh, right. definitely they've been very welcome in general. I think, you know, there is always... Some people that they still, you know, feel that resistance, but it's okay. We have time. <laughs> they will be assimilated. <laughs> I think the, the transformation, I think, also for us is towards hybrid Azure solutions. I think it, this is something that it really needs to, when you're thinking about Azure solutions, not just the solutions that we build, it's the solutions you're going to build. When you start thinking about governance and policy, this is becoming really, really important in enterprises. When it comes to about monitoring, you know, your environments, you start basically bringing more of your resources into the cloud. The analogy that I like to use is about control. The more control the, the, you have in your infrastructure and your assets, the less data do you need. The more you start basically having somebody else, you know, be sort of accountable for managing those resources on your behalf, the more data that you need to validate is the sort of trust and verify. You trust that the cloud is going to do the right things, but you got to go and verify it. So, and then you got to bring this concept of governance and policy. That is the way how you validate trust. If the way how we're going to help you is to say, look, we want to go and basically look about your entire hybrid cloud, all the resources that you have in the on-prem that is running in AWS on Azure. If we're going to provide you with the tooling and the capabilities to actually enable that sort of trust and verify capability with the tools that we're going to hopefully be delivering.
Absolutely. And we're going to start looking a little more at the AI stuff, some of the intelligent management. What should we actually be doing? Yeah. How do we have yeah. this, is, this is actually one part that I think that for us is pretty exciting. Satya has been really uh, pushing all of us to start really thinking about AI in all of aspects of our products. And this is more of a prediction. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, you know, it is a prediction. You know, we are, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I think think about one thing that I think you're going to start saying uh, more and more. Data is going to become a your new tool for making decisions in the future. So if you think about how we are collecting data nowadays about the infrastructure, the problems that you are experiencing, incidents, remediation of those incidents, all that information. We want to basically start putting it in a way that is actually easy for you to actually do intelligent tasks. If we want those intelligent tasks to be automated, if, of course, we want that to be automated with PowerShell. So the relationship between the data and how you transform that data into intelligent actions, if be able to power them through uh, technologies like PowerShell, is what this is really trying to do, is this continuous intelligence, continuous management of your infrastructure. And with the integration now in terms of the Azure management, there's this thing called App Insights that actually we attach to kind of organizationally, which is doing some cool work there yep. also. We can hook in nicely. Yeah, this is connecting into one. bots and chats and be able to actually Absolutely. collect that data. I mean, how many of you use a chat or a bot to actually do incident communication? A few people. I think, you know, in about five years, if I ask that question again, I bet you most of you will be raising your hands because it's really start becoming really, really quickly a very easy way of communication. So... Keep that in mind. Last but not least, uh, we will deliver some native PowerShell experience in Azure. We'll go to the Azure mm -hmm. portal and get a, a PowerShell experience. And in theory, you'll be able to navigate through your Azure resources mm -hmm. like you would in PowerShell. Over time, we'd love it to be integrated. So what you do in PowerShell, change the GUI. What you do mm -hmm. in the GUI can change. Yeah. So it's going to be a great experience. Including command lines. How many of you use Azure command lines today? OK. What do you think about the quality of those command lines today? Seriously? They're great. They're yeah. <laughs> great? So, so for us, this is something that is really important to us because, look, uh, we need to bring the PowerShell experience to be fantastic. It has to be equally or better what is in Windows. That is our goal. It's going to take us a little bit of time, but that's what I mean by including the command lines. Yeah, I know that Jeffrey now is basically looking into the command lines, how we're we going to start improving them. So I expect within the upcoming months, this is going to start becoming a much better experience. It things like you are having issues today with SDK versions, things like that. Is we are hoping now that team, we start basically becoming more integrated part of the organization, I think we, you're going to start seeing improvements in this area pretty quickly. Okay, but, um, the last thing really says, deliver a native experience of PowerShell this isn't about native code. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and did you want to do yeah. that? Yeah, we can do this. So, you know, just we're going to go really quick on this, but I just want to show you sort of the Azure Cloud Shell and what it is, how it's going to work. So if you go, the, so the Azure Cloud Shell is the new name. People have been calling it the Azure CLI, et cetera. The name that we're going to be coming out with is, is the Azure Cloud Shell. So when you are basically in the Azure portal, you'll have the ability to click on the button and you will see two experiences. One, a bus experience, another one is going to be a PowerShell experience. If you go to the next one, I think it provides you sort of how it's going to work. So you're going to be able as a user, any place in Azure, be able to configure what is your default shell experience. If you want to use bus because you like to use Python command lines, see the sort of the bus experience, you will have that as a choice. Or if you want to use PowerShell, uh, you will have that as a choice. Once you click on that PowerShell experience, it will be safe. That becomes your default experience. If from that point on, when you call the Azure shell, you know, you will get basically your PowerShell experience and then you just basically party on like you normally do. <laughs> Yo. Yeah. In what way? Oh. Uh, there is an RBAC. You can do this with RBAC capabilities. So yeah, you can use RBAC to control some of the functions because this will show up as, you know, as a function. The question is, I don't know if so you can disable just one shell, so you got to disable the entire experience of the shell. I'm not sure about that. That one I need to know. I don't know if you know, but I got to look into that. Well, but I know that you can, the, yeah, the function you can disable, but I think so you disable the shell, you disable all the shells. 
with our back. I don't think you can just say use one versus the other, which I think is what you. Uh, Yeah. We'll look into it. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. You still yeah. might get the prompt, yeah. but you won't be able to manage the resource. Yeah. Concretely, we take your Azure credentials and log you in. Yeah. We have Azure connection with those credentials. Yeah. And then all the Azure commandments go through the ARM. The mm -hmm. ARM is the control point for our back. So the yeah. user, this does not allow the user to do things that they couldn't otherwise do. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, so, so no, go ahead. Go yeah, go ahead. A couple more. Yeah. Yeah. So with RBAC, you can do, yeah, with the RBAC, you can create user groups. If you also, within that user group, you can have the subscriptions that the vessel participates into a particular experience. So my, my understanding that will work. Uh, but what I'm going to do, because I think this is an area that I think we got to be very clear. I'll take that. So when we make the announcements, uh, I'll be sure that part of our uh, blogging in the communication uh, speaks about how the UI actually enable or disable the experience based on some of the capabilities and access so through our pack, so CS user login. We'll, we'll make the that point very clear. Yeah. No, it's a great question, Elias. I don't, I have the vague answer, not the right answer. <laughs> update the modules. Oh, you mean like, yeah, so you are in this experience, say go update modules? Not yet, not yet. Uh, we're not gonna have the, cap the, the current, uh, is that whatever are the command lets of that particular service or modules, they will be basically pulled from the Azure experience right now. Eventually, uh, we want this experience to go into galleries, you be able to do update modules, but you, you gotta think about it, it will be in the VM, right? So it will be in the VM that you are. So you're not gonna have like global updates, like, okay, I wanna take a collection of VMs to apply this. So that won't work in the experience. But if you are here in a VM, you wanna do updates on that particular VM, in that scope, you will be able to and do that in the future. this context, just to be clear, when you have permission, because you're logged in as you, you don't have anything you, you're not gonna be able to get to, but you can manage all the VMs mm -hmm. from like one command yeah. in your subscription, you can say, you know, get this process from all the VMs, the LSAS process, high or low, get the high count, and you, and so you can, you can, it gives you a nice, easy way of, of um, performing PowerShell in the power in the Azure context. And over yep. time, the same basic experience, because it's actually implemented as a module, yep. can actually come down to your local desktop, yep. and you can have the same yep. kind of capability yep. over time. We have like sure three I questions. I'm not sure I understood the question correctly, but the but when we provision this environment for you, we will provide you the latest versions of the Azure commandlets. Okay. Yeah. When they, well, you can yeah. update the, But can you update the, the commandlets on the modules in the session? You should be able to exactly. eventually. Exactly, no. You won't, yeah. because you'll have the most up-to-date. Exactly. It's not physically impossible to update them, because no. there's no update. Yeah. You might ask, can I bring it down level, but I don't know. Yeah. That's the question. Can I install the old module? So can I download from the gallery? So can you can you download from Alice into a guide? That's what it. Is. It's not so yeah. much from the Azure modules, but I, that's what I heard. It's just no, so I think it, uh, module download, and, and we should. No, uh, this is I, no, this is good questions. I mean, like uh, I, it seems like we don't have the right answer, so I'll go find the right answer. Where can we get it? So. Uh, In theory. Yeah, today, 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 that is the case. I just don't know when we go off live, we may be running PowerShell 6. Uh, so I just need to go figure out how that is going to work. We got the same big advantage in the Azure shell that I can have a transcription documentation of all the things going on. It's how easy it is uh, to give my transcript when I work with the, uh, the Azure. So I can't I can't tell which question actually was meant. Let me see if I, it could be two different things I heard. One says 
hey, look, um, we don't really now, how, do I get a, how do I get a transcript here of what I've actually done? I always use that. And the other one says, as I click through the GUI, can I get a transcript of what PowerShell was actually executed and how we do it? No. And the answer is not yet. But no, yeah. not yet. We should actually, just to be clear, we're actually going to run ourselves out of time. This we, has been we fun. We run out of time. So one thing, after if you after. click, 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 click. Uh, 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 so we're going to do a private preview. We're going to announce the private preview next week. So and if you want to be, know you know, so. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So. Pardon me? The AMA session, last session of the day. Yeah. Oh, yes. the AMA. oh, yeah, we do have a, a team, you know, so the PowerShell team, and uh, we are going to do an AMA. Uh, I think at the, I forgot what time it is. It's like it's the last session of the day. So if you have more questions, please come and see us. Bring those questions. The summary, pretty quick. Contribute. Focus on hybrid. You know, DevOps is now. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>